Okay, I think we'll get started and then people will find in. Um, welcome back for returning audience members and welcome for the first time to Ice Cream Social for all, all of our new viewers. Um, so Ice Cream Social is a new art exhibition space and studio space. We actually just opened our studios this week. Um, and our first show in the space is Terrarium. Let me do my usual turn around so you guys can see the studios are along that side of the building. That's our first phase of studios. And then the show kind of sprawls out <laughs> across the whole floor. Um, and we have an interesting cage space that some of the works are installed in. I think almost everyone on this panel has worked inside of the cage. I think Kaya is outside. Um, and our first show came from an open call. So it's a widespread of media um, and artists from kind of around the country. Um, and so we organized this series of panels to try and subdivide and get into the details of all the sub themes um, within the show. But the larger theme of the show is um, growth, different forms of growth, inside containment, outside containment, um, themes of evolution, social growth. Uh, so the artists who are on the panel with us tonight are all kind of united in the theme of strange places and um, senses that are stored in the subconscious and I call it the act of finding. Um, all of this odd like sensory digging around and recalling um, via memory and place. So uh, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the pieces that they have in the show. Um, and then we're gonna dive into their practices in general um, and, and talk about some older work. By the way, I'm Jen Cacciola. I'm the program director here. <laughs> Almost forgot <laughs> again. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce each of our artists um, with a brief bio for each. So uh, Sibley Barlow explores ideas surrounding identity, repetition, labor, and time particularly as they relate to the body, as well as intersections between civilization and the wild environment. Their work privileges process and seeks to consolidate performance with the object. Sibley works across mediums and crafts, grouping work as widely varied individual projects. The expansive subject matter Sibley explores is unified by repetition, a series of paintings or a single image built on hundreds of marks. They work primarily in painting, drawing, and installation. Sibley was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and received their BFA from Ball State University. They currently live and work in Mamaroneck, New York. So super local to Ice Cream Social. Lindsay Davis makes large-scale paintings and sculptures that challenge the viewer's perception and experience through Gestaltism. Gestaltism is a psychological theory postulating that individual pieces of the visual puzzle of our reality have their own connotations, but together with all of the other pieces make up what we consume and how we dictate meaning from our reality. By making works that are both on and off of the wall, she creates a composition that moves as you move through it. The individual works have subtleties that can only be experienced through the natural and almost dogmatic urge we have to walk through the space, but in doing so, it changes how you perceive the space and the works within it. Lindsay has exhibited throughout the country in Europe and South Africa, and she is currently showing at the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the Parthenon Museum in Nashville, Tennessee. She received her BFA from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Tufts University. She was raised adjacent to New York and currently lives and works in Nashville, Tennessee. Kayoshito is fascinated with the creative expansion through art. She focuses on landscape inspired abstract mixed media pieces heavily combined with drawing on mylar. Her bold but elegant use of color creates compositions that are intuitive, translucent, and complex. With a strong interest in Carl Jung's psychology and his art utilized in search of the self, 
She thinks of memories perceived and stored in the unconscious, extracts and transforms them in abstract form, creating a landscape of emotions. Her work has been exhibited at Queen's Botanical Garden, Governor's Island Art Fair, Walter Wixer Gallery, Denise Bibro Gallery, One Art Space, and other galleries and spaces in the US and other countries. She was born in Hyogo, Japan, and works and lives in New York. Sarah Valeri um, works within the non-gravitational fields of color and light of painting. She explores temporal forms and landscapes in states of change. Elements and beings in her imagery try to find more adaptable forms of strength or power, regeneration, evolution, brightness, vitality. Sarah has exhibited internationally and throughout the metropolitan area in curated and independent exhibitions. She also works as an art therapist in Brooklyn. So I thank all of our artists for joining us tonight. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna start out uh, by looking at each of the works that are in the terrarium exhibition, um, and then we'll take a wider view of their practice. So maybe Kyle, could you uh, speak to us a little bit about these two pieces? So also to give everyone a view of them in the space. They're pretty large um, mm -hmm. and they're hanging right near the window. And again, this is on Mylar, which was mentioned in your bio. Mm -hmm. So they really let in a lot of the light from the environment. Yes. I'll let you take, take over. <laughs> okay, thank you. I mean, for, um, for the big, um, I would like to uh, say thank you for uh, this, you know, wonderful uh, show and uh, I'm very, very, you know, um, excited and a very, you know, feel honored to be part of it. And uh, also this uh, uh, artist uh, panel discussion has been so um, very nicely, you know, uh, put together and I'm um, very also happy to be, um, you know, um, be uh, talking with you guys tonight. Um, so this piece is a, a, a series from the uh, emotional landscape. Um, uh, these are the abstract paintings. I basically uh, um, get the uh, inspiration and uh, the resource from you know what is the uh, you know uh, the what is about you know our unconsciousness. And uh, I, since I've been sort of working on this um, topic and uh, theme uh, a long time, it sort of naturally um, took a form of a looks like a landscape. So I call mm -hmm. them, uh, start calling them an uh, emotional landscape. And it sort of really fits me because the, um, you know, I'm not talking about one emotion, like a happy, sad, or, you know, anything like that. It's more of uh, the mixture of this you know, volume and uh, um, because, like, uh, we sort of see and sense, you know, using, you know, all five senses. Um, you know, by looking, by hearing, by, you know, smelling, talking, uh, all those uh, the elements of uh, senses uh, sort of, you know, being stored in, within us. And uh, I think it's, by now, it's a very, very like, a large amount of, you know, amount of data and then, I'm sort of, you know, wondering where are they actually and then how, how they sort of stored in our, uh, you know, wardrobe of mm -hmm. mind and uh, uh, how, how would, uh, you know, sort of make, you know, us as we are right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's my um, inspiration and uh, I just uh, work with that, start with that. And uh, uh, this piece is particularly, uh, I was in the mind uh, uh, when, when I began, uh, began them uh, for the particular, um, um, you know, 
uh, place uh, to be hung. Uh, mm -hmm. So I thought that it, it's going to be a big space and, and it's very, um, very uh, full of light. It was like, you know, lots of windows around us and mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, well, I wanted to, you know, hang in the mid air mm -hmm. because of that. Because of the surface is the Myra, which is the uh, uh, drafting film. Uh, it's not like you know, it's not like opaque as a paper. It's uh, semi-transparent, and uh, mm -hmm. it sort of lets the uh, light, um, you know, uh, through mm -hmm. the surface. But it, so, it filters it a little bit too. Yes, yes. So, so it kind of glows. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to utilize that uh, sort of brightness, uh, transparency. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's how it uh, came about. Thank you, Kaya. Also, Thank I didn't you. mention, but um, if anyone has questions, you can write it in the chat. It'll just come to me, though. So I am seeing them. <laughs> and if there's time at the end for questions, I'll go through those. Um, and we can pose those to the artists at the end. Thank you, Kaya. Okay, Lindsay has a few small pieces. Um, so I'm gonna go through them just as you're talking. And then if you want yeah. me to go back to one in particular, just holler. Um, yeah. But so I'm gonna let Lindsay take the lead. Yeah, uh, well, the open call was like about growth. And so I chose pieces that had this uh, repetitive nature in it because normally my work is a bit fast, like I'm all about gesture and like I burn my own pieces of wood for charcoal and I love to get that big gesture going as the first mark and then go with the energy. But uh, in September of 2020, I, I lost my last parent suddenly and I kind of wanted to use my studio practice in a way that was, uh, let me process that a bit better. So having this something very repetitive and redundant to do helped push time forward in a way where I was able to reminisce and not just keep changing what I was looking at. And I had more time to actually digest. Um, so with this one, it was very, it's like the only, it's the only I want to say 2D, but it's not 2D because it's, mm -hmm. it's a sculpture, but it's a wall sculpture. Um, but it has these redundancies to it and the, like, the changes of texture and untouched texture, which is the wood, mm -hmm. or, and then the painted wood and that it has time on it and like the visceral like weather that has to happen for that paint to be removed. And yeah. then, uh, though, then the, uh, little, those are toothpicks actually, that I just drilled holes and just put them all in there. And that redundant drilling uh, forced me like sit down and mm -hmm. do that in a very thoughtful manner. And having a little bit of like this fluorescent pink was just a way to catch the eye and put into a composition of like natural material or close to natural mm -hmm. material and then a pop of pop of something else. And I think that's like the control versus not control of life and experience and how we move forward. And we don't get to choose how that forward movement happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, but the other pieces uh, have, yeah, like this one, um, it's, I remember I was, this is the first time I was using clay, like oven baking clay. Mm -hmm. And cause it was just, like, I didn't really want to get up. I didn't want to do anything. I wanted to like just work with my hands and just stay stagnant in a way. So mm -hmm. I just, I wrapped, I just started like using my hands and just like crushing into the clay. And it was a very like, like um, a stress ball almost. Mm -hmm. And I just, that human touch and then that frozen human touch and how mm -hmm. time keeps moving, but you can freeze things and, yeah, just that kind of aspect. And then the stacking, because we just stack one thing after another in this kind of, in this life we lead, we like build buildings on top of old buildings. We just go anew and uh, yeah. And so that's kind of the, the, to the, the like stacking of that and then the visceral mm -hmm. touching of that one. 
and yeah. then the um the next and one bef before you go to the next oh, one sorry. um <laughs> i just want to show everyone i don't know if my little windows are blocking you guys but um so just so you guys can see the installation shot of where that piece by Lindsay is it's on this pedestal um so like the beginning of the show a lot of these guys are in that section which feels to me is about like touching and feeling around and like a discovery section in this beginning part of the show um but as you lead into like the more social growth section of the show, this crazy piece by <laughs> Anya Rosen is placed right next to the one that Lindsay was just talking about. And even just hearing like more of the background story of how this piece came to be, it just like the two of them fit together so well. Um, and on the other side, I wish I had a wider view, but on the other side is um, a painting by Natalie that is like a lot about social anxiety and not fitting in quite. So it's wonderful to have your little symbol of like a material being forced in a way and like the anxiety and the wildness, the chaos mm -hmm. between Anya's piece and Natalie's piece there. Oh, yeah, and this kind of just um, like speaks again about the like redundancy of just drilling those holes and getting them like to be like, perpendicular and not too angled and uh, just like that trigger finger of holding the drill down like was kind of just like, like I was just tense holding that the whole time and uh, that was like a very like feeling that feeling and then like the burning of the wood itself is like I don't know, this release of a mm -hmm. new in this way, like like how indigenous people like, uh, do controlled burnings of land to actually uh, like <laughs> make it so it can Regrow. be fertilized. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and how like, you know, that loss of knowledge, like, but, but you know how that happens. But uh, yeah, then how this, um, I after I made it, it, I was looking at it and it was like a, functional comb mm -hmm. like I could brush it, my hair with it and this idea of like breaking down function um for what like what is that function the brushing the hair is that like a familial thing is that a self-soothing mm -hmm. thing and how do we self-soothe and mm -hmm. the ways in which again the repetition do, yeah exactly and it all kind of feeds into itself in that repetition, mm -hmm. in ritual, um, and in trying to, like, uh, like, I don't know, notch time in a way mm -hmm. that makes it like it happened. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to mark an event. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this piece um, by Lindsay is on a pedestal that's, they're kind of like, opposite one another on different mm -hmm. sides of the cage. Um, but it's at the top of this wonderful little corner that has um, smaller, two small paintings by Sarah. So one of them is hanging on the pedestal. Um, another one is down low, uh, which Sarah will talk about it, but it's these wonderful little like sense of spores and undergrowth and underbrush and everything happening and then this big like explosion of brush happening up here um so Lindsay's is kind of directly in contact in, in conversation with these pieces by Sarah that we'll get to next um but yeah so it creates this nice little tight corner of activity here at the front of the show okay Thank you, Lindsay. Sarah, take it away, walk us through. So you have these three paintings and then another one deeper into the show. Okay. So um, I began working on these early last year and there was, um, I really fascinated with like all the multitude of darkness that I could find with the paintings. And I was particularly working with um, ranges between red and green, which mm -hmm. I know a lot of artists really love, but um, I love the, like there was a vitality in the darkness. So it was not so much a, a thing of darkness is a sadness or darkness is grief, but there was so much happening within the dark spaces of the painting they might look like. Um, 
a supporting figure, but there really mm-hmm. is something that I would look into and, and find something in. Um, I also found like when I was painting these and I don't know if like, like the blue um, is kind of flat actually. And in a lot of paintings, instead of using like a, a darkness for something that might be a, a sadness or a feeling of like a heavy feeling, I, I wound up using like very neutralized, like a, a gray. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if that happens a lot in, in these paintings, but I, I spent a lot of time looking for like the gray that was the stock, like it didn't have movement. It was, it was hard to find, um, especially since gray interacts with so many other colors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm seeing some of those like muted areas. Here. Yeah, but then um, I was reading a lot about um, the regeneration of the forests, both the destruction and the coming back of the forests, um, how people are trying to relearn how the forest actually grows and lives as a complete organism. And these little like, um, I'm sure it's, it's very much, you know, in the consciousness right now, this sort of like, Mm -hmm. love of the mythology of the mycelium and like how they're all connected underneath and they're sharing their nutrients and they love each other and they recognize like this tree recognizes that tree and knows it needs some nitrogen and like all this conversation going on so it's it's almost this like embodiment of unconscious like a connected space and um I, I really like the idea of like these dark and unknown spaces being so incredibly rich and um surprising and full of life and then this is the big one that's um, toward the center of the show, I guess I would say. Um, and then Tavia's piece is kind of encroaching along the border and you're um, next to Ruth's um, pieces that are a lot more directly about evolution and um, taxonomy. Cool. Okay. Um, so also I was gonna, well, I guess you guys sort of mentioned, um, your sources already, um, and, and your relationship to the theme of, um, what happens in the unconscious, but if you want to mention anything more specific about your sources, um, please do also. Um, okay. And then Sibley, just so everyone can see, Sibley is kind of in the center point between these two sections. Um, and this zone, I kind of think of as like the shifting moments and the moments of transformation. Um, let me go back to the full view. So Sibley, take us through this piece a little bit and like, um, and your sources also. Um, so this is what I consider to be a landscape. Um, I consider pretty much all of my paintings to be landscapes and I see them in that way. Um, this is a painting of a pool that I actually lived around. Um, and it was an apartment complex that I moved into. There was four small buildings um, and in the middle there was a small pool. Um, and so this is a painting that I started when I first moved there. Um, for whatever reason, I didn't have any plan in mind because I usually don't for most of my pieces. Um, sorry. Um, and uh, like over time, I'd worked on this for many years as I lived there um, without much thought to it other than a exploration in color. I just um, kept layering it. Um, and looking back on it now is kind of when I get the meaning from it, because since moving from that, I'm seeing it in a new light, of course. Um, and I think it's holding memories is really what is like center to this piece. Um, yeah. It, it's like, uh, hmm. It was like um, that, that place that I lived in was a big transition place in my life, um, really intense period of my life, a lot of like really great memories, but it was also um, some of the hardest times in my life or maybe the hardest time in my life I spent there. Um, and I think um, that pool being centered in the middle of the apartment complex being like very much a community space where everyone was mm close and knew each other um, 
a lot of my experiences there, you know, were centered around that pool. Um, I also find it kind of interesting it being a pool or a body of water, because I think for like really everyone, it seems that bodies of water really hold a lot of memories for people. Mm -hmm. They seem to stick there. Um, and so in that way, I just um, kind of think of this as a landscape similar to my others and that it's um, represents the way that we're in a space. Um, but we experience that space internally as much as or more than we are seeing it externally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's a lot of like themes of cleansing, obviously, and and rebirth. Um, but it's I like that it's in this structure, this vessel that feels kind of shaken. It feels uneasy. You know, it feels like it's being shifted around, um, even though it's a, a source of like stability, it mm -hmm. seems like for you, you know? Yeah. I also find it interesting because it um, holds a lot of memories that I feel that I don't hold in my head, which I know is untrue. They're in there somewhere but it feels very much like um, these are things that are held in this painting outside of me. It's filed away somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I think I have a detail shot of the lovely grid that's just like floating across. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Um, so Kaya, we're going to come to um, this project of yours from 2017 of, of photos slash drawings that you did in Iceland um, to start our discussion about place. Um, I know it's maybe it's more or less specific um, for each of you, but I know Kaya, you're very attached, it seems, to place in your work. Um, can you speak about the connection between um, like nature or place and the subconscious for you or the unconscious while you're working? Uh, sure. Okay. So um, fundamentally, I guess the, the relationship between the uh, our unconscious and the landscape um, I sort of see the connection uh, about the sort of accumulation of the uh, elements. So as in nature, like um, the accumulation of uh, the water and the sand or um, ground or vegetation, um, um, you know, all, all that is sort of um, sort of accumulated as mm -hmm. layers, and then sort of um, then um, you know there will be uh, some sort of a movement, uh, like a natural phenomena, so like uh, you know water, you know rushing the ground, or uh, the air is blowing the mm -hmm. you know vegetation and sort of you know always sort of you know making this very slow uh, movement I think mm -hmm. and, and all of these like events always happening on different planes yeah yeah like stacked yes and uh, I think I see the connection with that and uh, sort of our like um like a mind uh, the evolution of like you know or shifting of our mind mm -hmm. always like you know uh, moving uh, you know even the, the memories like you know we you know it's not always the same like you know it sort of slightly changes all the time mm -hmm. but, and certain so, things kind of guess. come to prominence while other yeah. things and away. other things you know yeah going back and stuff like that so I think I uh, it's very fascinating you know sort of those uh, balances in between those mm -hmm. 
and uh, yeah. yeah. Um, sure. Um, I don't know how much I should go. Oh no, I was I was just point. gonna point out like what you're saying happening also in the paintings that are in the same series as the um, terrarium piece, but because they feel uh, once you get closer to them, they do feel very structural. It feels like there is a structure under all of this movement mm -hmm. um, that all of the growth is built on top of, you know? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, that's Which is a point. strange thing to happen on mylar, you know? So it's like you have weird <laughs> moments of um, fluidity and transparency and then mm -hmm. other moments that are very um, layered and weathered and, and structured, mm -hmm. like I said. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, which feels I'm glad like you mentioned that because yeah <laughs> no I'm I'm gonna you mentioned that about the structure because I I don't know it I just seems to ha have it all the time I mean, mm -hmm. very from the very you know early years so I think it, the the structure with the more of the fluidity uh sort of um, combined yeah and uh, yeah. And then I have these um, by Sarah. These are from a different series, um, but I, I like that we include them here because I still see your hand in them. <laughs> and I still see like your, your relationship to light and I still, they don't feel unearthly. You know, they still feel bound by the world around us, even though they're almost entirely abstracted. Um, can you speak to kind of the same question as Kyle, um, how you see the connection between nature and place relating to the unconscious that happens in your work? I'll say there's, um, I've been thinking a lot about that for the past couple of years and for um, through some of my opinions, which we might see later, there is, I was very focused on like, well, there are all these specific relationships between all these very idiosyncratic beings and this bee has to be with this flower and this um, tree has to be with this, you know, mushroom down under the ground. And um, because when I was young, I lived in many different environments. I have memories of these different places like the desert and the forest and the seashore. And um, I, all of my memories are sort of gathered like in like the era of the desert and the era of the rainforest <laughs> and the era of the, and when I, a lot of those places that were in the West Coast, I haven't seen in decades. And so it's, um, I went, I was going back and forth between like wanting to create, recreate it. Like, you know, if there's a saguaro, like what are the things that would live with it? And if there was like a ghost flower, like what is the creature that would be there with that flower? And I, I wanted to like mark it in space and time, like this living mm -hmm. being at this time in this era. And I started to feel like it got um, stuck like, and it, I mean, I guess that was the intention to create an anchor of mm -hmm. some kind. Um, and I noticed my painting then also started getting very, a little tight because I was trying to like very much to like make that thing. Um, and there's a Joseph Campbell. I was reading one night, like sort of off and on and he was talking about how like when you are focused on um, these specific aesthetic things um, to like, the place and time and like the artifacts of a of a myth that like it becomes a very material thing that does become more mm -hmm. of a closed space and not like the element or like the essential what is the essentialness of that story and it's the essentialness mm -hmm. of that story that's connected to other all the, all the other stories not the costume or the um you know or the bowl or the whatever but the reason for the costume and the reason for the bowl and the reason for the fire so I was thinking of more um, things that, mm -hmm. like what is the central element? Um, and also like, you know, hearing, you know, everyone talk about like repetition. Um, I, I actually made these when I had COVID. So I was at home for quite a long time. I, you know, missed school and missed work and then it was the holidays and I was still home and I was still tired. And so there was very much a, a process of like, I had time to sit and layer and layer and layer and mark the time. make these make the <laughs> mark the time and use these like um like very neutral like repeated shapes to create mm -hmm. so many different variations um but so I do I do like um they also both started with a fixed 
a fixed shape of some kind, like a, a fixed monoprint mm -hmm. on the back to make the rings. And then um, there's like patterns in there that were made with wood cut that I couldn't move uh, while I was painting into it, which is a different experience for me. My paintings change a lot while I'm working on them. So to mm -hmm. have, there was, there was that anchor and quite a lot of variation and, and like rhythm trying to change um, around it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Lindsay, uh, same question for you. Um, you repeat the question, uh, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, like how, how you see place, nature or, and or place. Cause I know uh, you guys okay. are all thinking yeah. about different um, versions of place, like yeah, in this, relation like, to the, this yeah. whole, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you so caffeinated right now. I, 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 <laughs> Did the talk the right way? Yeah. All the thoughts come at once. <laughs> yeah, that I can't even say them. <laughs> uh, so this series like, came about with, I was trying to paint without paint. And mm. here in Nashville, there is an artist review store all based on donation, um, like anything. And it's all, it's called Turn Up Green Creative Reuse. So I could go there and get rolls of fabric, stuffing, paint, tiles, weird garden stuff, wow. frames, VHSs, anything. It's wild. It's like, a, it's my favorite place in town. But anyway, um, I got these like so much fabrics like, and linens and, um, so I wanted to paint with that and figure out mm -hmm. a way to expand uh, like my mark making vocabulary because up till then it was a lot about um, figuring out like obvious ways of making a mark like with a mm -hmm. tool but like what about uh, like a cloth material and then the cloth like this velvet and then this pattern material like doing its own thing and then what if I stuffed it and then mm -hmm. that idea of like it coming off the uh, flatness actual of the lighting canvas. yeah mm -hmm. and um and then touching it and like it feeling like a pillow like comfortable mm -hmm. and reminds you of that comfort but and so that's even like the in the title like tactile reference to the ephemeral like the ephemeral is like this gooey ethereal like what like just angelic ideas and it could be super close to heart it could be based on nostalgia um, identity whatever but it's floating it's your soul it's these unconscious things that you can't really grab mm -hmm. and so having like this idea of comfort um, right in front of you that's stuffed it's a pillow like you could potentially rest there it's like this mm -hmm. real tactile thing that kind of brings you this sense of place while also like creating this space behind mm -hmm. it that's a bit like uh, more atmospheric and so mm -hmm. there's like these anchors with the comfort the ideas of comfort like when you're floating in the uh, uh, just in the void of yeah. consciousness <laughs> so it feels very everything but the pillow even the marks on the pillow feel very digital even mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. So it really does isolate that pillow as like the one thing I feel like I can stay with and grab onto. Yeah. So when like, so when your sense of place, like you don't even know it and you're just floating, like existing in this life, like having something to grab onto. And like yeah. maybe that thing is a comfort or something like that. Um, with this work, uh, like with all the series of stuffed paintings, kind of on that. Love me some stuffed paintings. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sibley, I love this painting that's happening in the midst of like crazy foliage and everything. Can you explain mm -hmm. <laughs> explain this to us? So, again, same question. Like how how you connect um in your work like a sense of place with the ideas of the unconscious or the subconscious mm -hmm. um well in regards to this painting i um obviously it's like very abstract but i'm doing like um an outdoor painting in front of you know like beautiful like landscapes um but i'm not like painting them directly I'm not even necessarily like looking at them while I'm doing this. Mm. I'm very much like into the painting, but I'm still out there. 
So for me, I really like painting outside because it's like a, a different way of like experiencing the space you're in mm -hmm. um, and having that still influence your work. Um, I think that um, the way that we see the, the space around us or the way we exist in landscapes is very limiting because we can only, we only see so much what we, what we see is um, limited to what our brain can process. And there's obviously so much more going on mm -hmm. than what our pea brains are mm -hmm. able to catch on to. Um, and so I see like the subconscious less as a way, as a um, thing that's in our heads and more of a thing that's surrounding us. Mm -hmm. And I think painting for me or art making um, is a really good way that just personally, I feel like I can take some of that from the outside and make sense of it. Something that like, I'm not able to see just being around. Mm -hmm. It kind of merges those two things. Yeah. So you're kind of viewing it in a reverse relationship <laughs> instead of like the filtration coming from what's stored inside onto the canvas you're viewing like the subconscious like a collective subconscious mm -hmm. sort of like that's stored in the world that you're mm -hmm. trying to process through painting yes exactly and like also i i really like thinking about it um about that idea from like a dry scientific kind of point of view um just, you know, like all the different things that we know um, about the world that are still beyond our understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then Sarah, I just, when I saw this in the folder, I just like, <laughs> I can't help myself with a good, <laughs> with like a really good uh, face. Like, what is this, a wolf? It's not a wolf. What, what animal? It's a, it's a canine type. Canine picture. type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I just like went wild for this and like mm -hmm. surrounded by this lush fluorescent pink. It's just such a great <laughs> supporting color for this being. Um, but so I wanted to uh, make space next for talking about um, veneration and representation of either spaces um that are that have a, spe a specificity that deserves um to be pointed out in the work or beings you kind of started talking about it earlier um your childhood homes that all had very specific identifiable environments um and sort of like your desire to to have fidelity to that, to representing those. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I know in our discussions, you were also bringing up um, a couple of pieces of literature that you were working on during this time. Um, yeah, so this uh, this is one of the paintings where I was talking about like making like those are the ghost flowers like to the left bottom corner and like the wild poppies that would be in the desert. And when I was painting this, um, I was in Massachusetts in the winter, but all of these flowers would have been actually blooming um, mm -hmm. while I was painting this far away in New England. Um, and I do like looking back at the idea of like pinning it down in place. It does like, um, I love that you call the pink like a supporting color because it is like a bright, vibrant color. And I, I often use color as a way to show like a, a form of strength um, or energy that's not what we would normally consider a form of strength, like something, it's not mm. bulky or monstrous or um, muscular, but it is quite like it's support, it's holding everything up just because it's so incredibly bright. And it's like, um, so that's, it is, um, but I do, but it is also like a very transparent sheet of color. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's like, it's, um, it's very vibrant and it's holding everything together with like nothingness. Um, mm -hmm. And I also think like I, I notice in a lot of my paintings um, lately, um, I keep calling it like a confusion between the land and the sky. And I don't want to use mm -hmm. the word confusion necessarily, but it is like there's 
like an intermixing or they're together or, and it's like mm-hmm. the way that they're, um, Fusion. they're real or not real. Yeah. Or they're, mm-hmm. you know, it have, they have a transformative state, I mm-hmm. think because of that, um, from not being too solid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you were mentioning when we were all talking, um, on the group, um, the abandoned islands, yeah um it's a yeah a book that i've been reading um that i really enjoy and i would highly recommend um to everyone so it's um abandoned islands um by cal flynn and she writes about all of these places um across the world that have been made so incredibly toxic or dangerous um by humans that humans will no longer go there either because you'll be poisoned radiated or you'll step on a landmine um and because there are no humans there, like these little um, bugs, it, I mean, it might start with like bugs and lichen. And then mm-hmm. people realize like, oh my gosh, this butterfly that we thought was extinct lives here. And sometimes their lives might be short um, mm-hmm. or, you know, or it might alter their genes in some way. Um, there's also an incredible amount of adaptations where um, there's a place in, on the border of Germany and France where like, about a, almost a hundred years ago, they dumped all of the chemical weapons they had left over after World War II. And it's still like a gray- What else are you gonna do with them, right? It was <laughs> like a gray slate, like in the middle of the forest and like nothing, like um, they even tried to replant it with certain trees that they thought would be able to manage yeah. it. Um, but there are these little lichen that are like, apparently they're powerful absorbers of toxins. Wow. And some of them can actually like, metabolize these toxins um and they she found out like there are all these ways that like the plants can actually some of them will make use it to make themselves poisonous as a defense um Mm. some of them can metabolize the toxins um some of them learn to be resistant to it so there's just like incredible diversity of responses to whatever is within like whatever's in the soil that they had that they're soaking up yeah and um you also mentioned the amitav Oh, Amitav Ghosh. Yeah, he's um, he's a writer. He writes a lot of fiction um, and novels and literature, but um, climate change is a subject near and dear to his heart. He's a very practical, um, honest, and compassionate speaker about climate change and how it's affecting global communities around the world. Um, he's from Southeast Asia, so he talks a lot about like the rivers and like living close to the water and being in relationship with the water and how it's changed like the course of his family's life moving from place to place. Um, But one of the things I've enjoyed about him is he's really tasking like artists and writers to um, imagine all the beings in the world, create forms for all the beings in the world, um, find a connection of empathy between all the beings in the world and not to make like humans as one central character um, mm-hmm. one central hero in every story but it's like this whole like collective of all of us together um facing these challenges i just i put those two in the chat for anyone who is interested um and then you also wanted to mention this um sky island alliance oh thank you i love this cool alliance. work i listen to them <laughs> they look awesome <laughs> They're incredible. Um, so they are based in the Sonoran Desert and the Sonoran Desert crosses the, the US-Mexico um, border. And they are a, a collaboration of cons- conservationists from both the US and Mexico who work together um, to catalog and um, like notice any changes in the, the environments, any changes mm-hmm. in the behavior of the animals. Uh, they have a huge like volunteer staff that go out and count and photograph and like document. Um, they've done an incredible amount of documentation about the effects of the border wall on the habits of mm-hmm. animals and also like their indigenous cultures that are split, like they have family on each side. So it's, um, they're really like on the ground all the time like as as caretakers, um, they have an, they're an incredible source of knowledge. If you're interested in um, any like documentation, like what it means legally, uh, what the federal laws are, how um, what the courts are doing about this issue, they have all of that information. And very sweet people. If you send them a donation, you'll probably get a handwritten letter. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but it's um, the, like what they mean by the sky islands are like, they're all these, this is, you know, the desert where it's very hot, but um, there's enough elevation at the tops of these mountain peaks that they've 
that they're each one is like a specific biosphere. Mm -hmm. So there are specific butterflies that might not fly all the way to the other peak. Like that's where they are or like a specific, like small animal. That's like, this is their home in the world, this one place. Um, so it's an incredibly delicate and um, beautiful, beautiful area. And I'm, I'm really glad that there's somebody on the ground there. <laughs> yeah. Keeping thank track of it. So yeah, thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, Kyle, same <laughs> question. How do you kind of parse out like when you want to name things and places um, and memories even specifically in your work? And when do you hold that information? How do you like, how do you meter that in your work? Um, or like, when is it important to you for a place to be specifically identifiable in the work? Mm, yeah, that's a very <laughs> difficult question. <laughs> but, uh, well, um, uh, do you mean by, you know, if there is any specific place? Yeah, so I guess in this, uh, for example, like in this series, mm -hmm. Um, like this didn't turn into a painting, right? Mm -hmm. Photography is a very specific choice. Yes, yes. You know what yes, I mean? Yes. Um, it still has your hand overlaying, but everything is pretty identifiable. Like I could potentially find this place and stand where you stood, mm -hmm. you know, based on the imagery. Um, yes. Is that a conscious decision that you make or that you think about and like way out when you're choosing to abstract something or not? Oh yes, uh, definitely, yeah. Well, this uh, city is particularly, um, I just titled them by the location coordinates mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's um, located in Iceland. And uh, I was very fascinated by its, uh, you know, landscape. Uh, it's very, I think it's very like young still and, and lots mm. of, uh, I think, uh, you know, incredible, uh, very like out of worldly, um, you know, scenery is like everywhere. And uh, mm. so I, I, I've been there um, a few years ago and I took a lot of uh, um, photographs and uh, I wanted to, not just that, you know, just, um, you know, make a painting of it, but uh, I just wanted to uh, do something with that, you know, very particular landscapes. And uh, I think it's already been so much going on, but very dynamic and um, in a way chaotic uh, movement going on. So I decided to, you know, make uh, my own interpretation or my, my own like you know addition to the scenery uh, and I decided to use this uh, very simple you know white lines to you know uh, create the different spaces in it mm -hmm. like you know how it like goes and also like you know contemplating on oh you know if, if it, it could have been like you know uh, bigger like higher like um, uh, level of the uh, gland it might could have been there and a uh, higher mountain up there and something like that that kind of mm -hmm. a sort of contemplation like you know thinking of you know maybe the land the, the mm -hmm. landscape may have you know its own like memories in it mm. yeah. so it sounds like it's um like a two-part practice where like work like this is more about the collection of all of those senses mm -hmm. that are then being translated unconsciously in the paintings in the other series. Mm -hmm. So this is like the intake part of the process and then the output is kind of the painting work. Okay, mm -hmm. or it could be like two different um, practice. Well, it's all, I think it's all one, like it enters and it sticks around and then 
mm-hmm. it like materializes however right you know yeah okay so and then also like you know like you mentioned earlier that the the you know fruitness or a lot of movement with the structure mm-hmm. yeah i just wanted to sort of sort of um um like not emphasize it but uh, it's like mm-hmm. you know just wanted to make a mark for, yeah you know, this one does seem to be a lot about yeah about the structure that's mm-hmm. perhaps like unconsciously underneath in the painting works maybe yeah cool. exactly. thank you Kai. um i'm gonna move to the next two pieces. So I have this one from you, Sibley. I'm just going to stay on this so people can also see this work, but I feel like it's part of the next um, question that I have for you. Um, So when we're talking about sensory messages that we're sending to the viewer, um, how, how are you, you using those and like in the process of making the work how are you finding the meaning of the work Mm -hmm. and is that like how are you finding the meaning of the work and do you how do you think that translates to the viewer um i typically am not able to find a whole lot of meaning in it until i get towards the end or i finish it to be honest Mm -hmm. Um, that's not always true, but, um, so I think, um, in that way, I am like just kind of experiencing what I'm doing or, you know, whatever I might be thinking about, however, um, the painting is looking at the time and reacting to that. Um, and I am thinking about the viewer at that point as well, um, trying to like give as many details as possible is always usually my goal because I feel like that is what gives people um, like a a full experience um, because we kind of see outside of looking at art, we kind of see like a very like large picture um, of what's going on around us. And then you can zero in on something and there's just, you know, paintings within the painting. Mm -hmm. Um, is what I'm trying to um, provide for the viewer. I don't know if that answers the question. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. So how, I guess, for the second part of the question of like how, or maybe you don't, maybe that's not part of the work process for you is like worrying too much about the meaning that the viewer gets. Is that what I'm hearing or like how do you does that factor in at all while you're working um as far as like what they're like getting out of it and what they're seeing no not really um it Mm. um having people like providing people with like a vessel to like project whatever Mm -hmm. they're um they want to see or they just naturally see is what's important to me Um, And even at the end, I have my own ideas about it, but I'm always curious to see what other people's um, perspectives on it, how it made them feel, what they actually see in front of them, because it's usually different from what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I I typically like um, for it to be ambiguous. You're kind of holding it to the point where sub and unconsciousness can meet with Mm -hmm. yours like not not going too specific to the point where like yours is coming forward Mm -hmm. in front of the viewers yeah yeah Mm -hmm. okay um i'm gonna pass to Lindsay. same question Mm -hmm. about meaning in the work and like so at what point does that arise in this unconscious way of working? And mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on like when or how the viewer gets meaning from the work? Is that part of your practice to like even think mm-hmm. about that, be considering about that? It sounds mm-hmm. like with the pillow work, 
you were. Yeah, it's right. more. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to make. I'm trying to make them just. I'm not trying to pigeonhole them into thinking or feeling anything specific. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm just making them more conscious of like their reality or question or not so sure of what they're looking at and then Mm -hmm. have more take more time to figure it out because we're so quick to like our brain is a puzzle solving organ and it thinks it sees something and it wants to solve it and think it understands it and then move on Mm -hmm. and so I like to add these little playful parts where like in my bio like I talk about the dogmatic urge we have to walk through the space but Mm -hmm. I try to play with that urge because this painting as you see like these things develop in the glare on the on the painting Mm. image to the right and you can't see it when you see it on certain angles Mm -hmm. so I uh, consistently try to initiate these pops of intrigue that you might not see all the time and it's only when you walk past it does it catch your eye and then it kind of forces you to stop and look again Mm -hmm. and that type of like physical stop and look again is what I'm trying to get and I don't know if there's like a metaphor in that with like people taking more time not judging a book by its cup you know all those things <laughs> that you can say but I think that's I just want people to slow down I think mm-hmm. so that's mostly it. <laughs> yeah and including little like reminders these little Mm -hmm. like unconscious reminders of other things yeah and very like like that That, could be like pull the viewer in different directions yeah yeah exactly so it's creating these like knowing knowing what tools you can use to initiate the to make the eye at like see space or the brain see Mm -hmm. use the eye to see the space there because oh there's a shadow so it must be projecting into Mm -hmm. this distance but then it stops you because there's flatness in it. And then having that play of space and flatness and these areas to go into, and then you're like, okay, I see that you walk away and glare happens. You're like, what? And it just adds more to it. Um, So I think it's that playfulness of knowing how the brain tries to see space and Mm -hmm. then destroying that. Yeah, just giving it enough to pull it apart. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Sarah same question and this one out of all of the images that we have of your work um, you noted it is much more geometric it still feels like you though (laughs) but um, same question like how you at what point meaning comes into it Um, it sounds like maybe for you it's a little earlier in the process maybe I'm wrong (laughs) Um, well I think like that exploration of place was very um because I think some of those the memories I have from Mm -hmm. all of those places are both like very conscious and and very unconscious that it's kind of like oh and I I think that's the thing that I was like how to like which side am I who am I listening to like which part of my mind or my body am I listening to um but I typically do like this um start with some movement and I I do really Mm -hmm. relate to what everyone's been saying about like the body is like a store Mm -hmm. of memories and um you know our the way I would describe like the unconscious or all of these memories is might sound very mundane like it's just like our senses collect these things and they are we have a memory of a sense and a memory of a collection of senses but I do feel like that still connects to all of the other like bodies with senses in one way or another which you know makes it more more of a numinous thing um, mm-hmm. but for, for this, yeah, I, I was really focused on, um, a beginning motion and it like created this like streak of light that is not like the brightest, um, thing in, in the image, but it's, it holds its own. And then it was this, um, the streak of like passing light that was, um, maintaining while everything else, um, I don't know, blew up. <laughs> like, it does, there's it like everything's. Like- yeah everything's yeah the um the ground is gone like the the shapes are peeling um so there it was more of a a feeling of like what is what is the density 
of, mm -hmm. of this image, like how, how many pieces, how close together, um, how close together do they have to be to look like they're moving apart and moving together. And um, so I, there was like a, a lot of like continuous tiny marks, like this, this particle of dust is here and this particle of dust is here to create this feeling of like everything's flown. Um, so it's very like, um, um, yeah, and it was, it was important that, that, uh, there's that space, like that green space, um, in the center is also not holding, but open, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and speaking of, um, fields like falling away, um, you've mentioned before different ways that you treat the ground. And, and the idea of a ground in your work. Um, so I thought I'd use this image as we lean toward talking about mark making. Um, in the family of senses, you all have very like identifiable ways of making marks. Um, and mark making is one of the last things I feel we can really control. <laughs> um, so, it's worth bringing this up as a topic. Um, but yeah, so Sarah, maybe you can speak a little bit more about, um, I know that's the, the falling away of the ground and the translucence um, and all that is particularly strong in, in this one too, right? Yeah, um, this is also painted on a UFO, which is, um, so I'll just say since it's like in the image and you can't see it directly, but it's like a very, um, it's like a, a layer of plastic uh, substrate. Mm -hmm. And so it's incredibly shiny. Well, not shiny, but like super smooth and super white. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it shines through quite a lot and gives a lot of that transparency, um, even when you have those bright colors that are, are holding their own. It's also really great to like mark into, as you're saying, like having, um, like you can scrape through the paint and make these lines and bring back the whites. and there's that like the sort of like jubilant repetition, like climbing up into the air that I think like that drawing gives you that looseness, like to have like your, your, um, your idiosyncratic movement, like traveling mm -hmm. and around. Um, so it's like- this, Right, cause to try and like go over the mark again, so that it's yeah. solid, it's like no longer your actual natural mark. It's you mm -hmm. tracing your mark. <laughs> yeah. And the, um, this was actually, um, I don't know. I don't know if I should talk about like the whole, um, exactly what it was. I do, I, I do like that, that this you. one is, a, I'll, I'll leave it ambiguous because I think it's interesting to like see like what, um, this one where people like acknowledge or like don't, don't acknowledge. But I think like the, um, the climbing upward is a sort of like ecstatic response maybe to, to grief. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Um, Lindsay. <clears throat> I love talking to sculptors about mark making. <laughs> Teach us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this piece was actually like one of the first sculpture pieces I made, like after a bit of a hiatus from sculpture. Oh, cool. um, a local artist here, Kit Ruther, uh, this amazing woman. Uh, she is so cool and is so open. And yeah, she, I went to her solo at a uh, local gallery here, David Lust Gallery, and she was there and she just let me chew her ear off and <laughs> uh, answered all my questions, like the real questions, like the secret behind the scenes kind of questions. Aww. And um, And she's like rather, small older woman and so I was like wow she can do it like mess around with a chainsaw and like big pieces <laughs> oh, of wood. I'm like oh wow I can do it um and so I had like found a bunch of found old wood and that like how time and weather interact with wood grain it's so interesting because mm -hmm. it depends on the species of wood with like the mm -hmm. tightness of the wood grain and how it erodes over time and I only know that because I spent years doing wood cuts and mm -hmm. also burning my own charcoal like pine is different but than vine or oak and everything and, and the and environment just, that it's drying yeah. in and aging in yeah it's yeah very receptive and, yeah so 
uh, so if you are able to strip how your brain sees this as a object and actually see the mar- the textures as marks, you mm-hmm. can really like understand mark making not only as like a painting or a drawing or a 2D process, but as a whole 360. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's really hard for me to even think of like a painting or a drawing to be 2D because you can hold it. It's flat, yes, mm-hmm. but you can actually hold it in space. Like it exists mm-hmm. and it doesn't only exist on a wall if you can hold it. So that's just my end. But anyway, um, just how even with mark making, how you can put all these different, like an airbrush versus spray paint versus like a mm-hmm. hard gestural, like black paintbrush line and all these things elude different reactions in how the viewer responds or how the brain even wants to see something. So how can you boil that down to objects as material for painting, basically? Mm -hmm. And so it was like wood and the wood grain and how that weather takes it away and all those little lines that you can see when you get up close, but back here, it just looks like just like kind of how wind goes on like grain and it's very slow and it exists for a second and then it's gone. And then the playfulness with the ponytails of horse hair, how that mimics that same falling down motion and how the hair Mm. and the wood grain have this thin nature to them. And then mm-hmm. also not then even to talk about like that, that le- weird little like paint line and where it is next to the crack and then how they play mm-hmm. with one another in their sense of like place and then how you see it happening like with the right in front or on the side mm-hmm. and like all these things like some like a hyper realistic drop painter or draw can redo this uh so what's the difference between their mark making process and the actual physical materials like Mm -hmm. you're going to do that same falling like so sensual motion uh, for the hair and then the slight little bit more aggressive pencil action for the wood grain and like if you feel those materials you can feel Mm -hmm. that mark making happening so uh, it's just yeah it's just like more there's like a lot of I get a lot of emotion into it and like see these metaphors with material and then the mark making and how we just have to strip away how our brain compartmentalizes things Mm -hmm. because anything can be a drawing, anything can like be a material for a painting, even if it's like fabric that you're stuffing or like some paintings I'll even stuff with whatever I can find at that artist reuse store, Turn Up Green. And they had a bunch of uh, fake fruit And so I just started stuffing my paintings with fake fruit because that's what I had. And like, yeah, it's just being playful and being able to open your perspective. Yeah, Yeah. so so there's a lot of like found marks involved Mm -hmm. in the sculpture too. And like marks that are wholly not controlled by you. They're controlled by environment. But it's also, you were speaking a lot about like, essentially um the empathy the empathetic is that a word power (laughs) of the viewer (laughs) like being able to look at and at the same time feel the gesture that your body made during the making you know that's something that maybe is more accessible in sculpture because it's an object Mm -hmm. um I don't know if I'd say that I don't know, yeah, I don't know. I don't <laughs> but know. it's it's visible. That's that's what you're saying. Is yeah. like the gesture of your body is visible. Yeah, and there's and also just something about um, having using like found or reused materials or just different materials as your mark making vocabulary, and you put mm-hmm. them together in a way that makes sense. Like you, when you're putting together like a composition for a drawing or a painting, you're trying to figure out how does this make sense to my own way, but when then you have objects as material, you're doing the same exact thing. You're just solving uh, some abstract problem and yeah. only you know when it's there. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah. Sibley, mark making. Talk to us about it. I mean, this is a very like, <laughs> maybe literal example because it's so linear, um, but there's, there are variations in the marks here, right? It seems like some are more, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking? Well, they're out of your hand, Mm -hmm. but they're still guided by you. And then there's some more like deliberate mark making happening. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to have a bit of both of those. Um, I always wish that my paintings were like a little less like tight and more expressive mm -hmm. often when I get into the line work. Um, but I think it works for me. I just need to embrace it. Um, but the the lines, um, what I that's obviously like a big trope for me that I use in a lot of my paintings. And I think what I like about them a lot is um, although I am like tracing, you know, over my previous marks, they are all like, it draws even more attention to the uniqueness of each of them, I think, mm. because they're so similar. You can catch like small mistakes essentially. Mm. And so as I make mistakes, and yeah. I'm not able to be perfect with what I'm doing, that causes a change and that will like ripple effect outward. Mm -hmm. um, and so that changes the painting in a way that like reflects like my body and the way like I was moving or how good I was that day. Um, and it reflects like the, the time that I spent on it. It takes, you know, obviously a lot of time to go as slow as I need to to trace things. And then at the end, you're seeing all of that time mm -hmm. in one single image. Um, so yeah, I think it's the, uh, the mistakes that are kind of out of my hand. It's very controlled, but very much like in the paintings control. Mm -hmm. Right, it's the, we're watching the intention for control, <laughs> kind yeah. of like. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, and then using this wonderful, so there's a lot of different types of mark making, um, but I also want to, so Kayo, maybe walk us through different techniques you use when you're mark making. And then, um, sure. well, let's talk about that first. Yeah. Yeah, mark making is fun. I'm just, I just love <laughs> just, you know, making marks. Um, I, I usually like you know uh, mix the uh, mix with the oil paint one layer and over that um, like uh, water um, based uh, acrylic paint and stuff like that. Uh, so if you see the like lower left corner, uh, you see some of those like smudgy uh, effects. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so um, um, it's like a lot of, um, you know, layers. Um, so you see that um, in the middle, uh, you see like a little um, pale pink uh, portion and uh, you see um, little like, you know, darker um, marks uh, behind it that's visible. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, building uh, like a thin layer mm -hmm. <clears throat> of colors and marks uh, sort of makes it more like a complex. And uh, I also um, um, like, I love to, you know, work with the um, drawing. So I use a lot of mm -hmm. pastels uh, lines uh, in between. So, um, yeah. If you see the details, I mean, you you, you see a lot of them uh, all over the place. I, I for me, like the most difficult part is to uh, try to make it organized. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just go all over the place. Yeah, and it seems like um, previous layers affect what the surface is going to be on the following layers, which relates to what you were saying in the beginning about layered experience and things like that yes, yes. and the layer uh, is sort of put laid against not to repeat it but uh, sort of different um you know portion of it to sort of find the find the new um find finding a new um i don't know for me the the combination or, you know, different like um, mix, mix of colors or different, you know, layering of my marks. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I might skip ahead a bit. I know um, Sibley, well, I guess 
I'll pose this question to all of you, um, but how are you guys thinking, if you haven't already mentioned it, about how the light and color in your work is affecting the subconscious of the viewer um, and the emotions of the piece? I'll pose that question to anyone who wants to jump in and then we can flip to your piece. I paired you guys up a bit. I mean, I, I would say that color is really my main language. And okay. it's yeah. something that like, whenever I'm, I'm painting, I, I might be thinking a lot about form and shape or place or, but um, at the end of the day, even if that's what I think I need to make, I make it with color. Like mm -hmm. I build, I build spaces out of color and particularly out of um, not just color, but like transparency and opacity so that you're like passing through and being stopped. Um, mm. And I mean, I can make a very flat thing <laughs> off, way out if I need to. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a flat painting. It's completely 2D, but it, I think it does have Doesn't quite really a lot of space in it. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's entirely with, with dark and light. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I, I tend to like, um, not feel like a painting is complete until I have a full spectrum of like mm -hmm. deep darks to, to whites. And I've, I've often thought like, oh, I really want to try to have like more limited palette, or I want to try to have like a closer range of tones and see what's, but it's like, it's not done for me. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's not going to land right until I have the full range, it's, it's all mm. gotta be in there at some point. So I'm, I'm not trying to, it just tends to, I'll, I'll be like holding out and be like, no, we need, we need midnight. <laughs> like, no, we, need, <laughs> we need like a cloud with the sun on it and your eyes hurt. Like I need both of those <laughs> in there at the same time. Um, yeah. <laughs> and there is a quite a bit of that also happening, I think in Kyo's work where there's these patches of, sun, especially in this view, these patches of sunlight. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're coming through. Yeah, um, that was a great um, um, place to be hanged. <laughs> yeah, they also like you know, you know, they look good, they would look uh, different in uh, the sort of during the day and you know the right uh, when the sun moves uh, from the morning to uh, evening. I guess so. So the fact that light coming through the piece and around the piece is important to you and part of the building of the piece. Mm -hmm. Like environmental lighting is a consideration for you. Yeah, for this particular um, yeah. installation, yeah. Um, Sibley, Lindsay, do you guys wanna speak at all on color, color and light? Um, yeah, I, I like to think about light in relation to color in my paintings and um, in the way that I kind of see it and think about it out in the real world because it's, you know, it's, again, going back to like looking at things in a like scientific way, it's very much like about like reflection, telling our brains what we're seeing. Um, and so I like to <clears throat> um, think about that when I'm painting because I feel like it builds complexity and it allows me to um, kind of have more understanding of what I'm doing <clears throat> and what's happening in front of me. Um, also in the past few years, I've been specifically painting a lot of blue paintings, just entirely mm -hmm. blue. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that's about, honestly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think but blue I think gets that, everyone at some point. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. Like moth it's, to light. <laughs> yeah, it's like universally like experienced, and I can think the same way, which is interesting. It um, sucks think, you in and opens you up at the same time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I heard somewhere I don't know if it was true that blue was the last color we were evolved to see. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true? true. Okay, yeah. Lindsay says it's um. true, so it's true. <laughs> I feel like yeah. that's for some reason we're still like oogled by it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can't that's get over so it. <laughs> yeah. 
Lindsay, oh, are, you, um, are you thinking about color a lot? There are color shifts in your work. Yes. So initially, yeah, initially people don't think I work with color um, when it does it and that is not important. And I didn't think it was that important in my work. Mm. Uh, but now I realize it is, it's very important in my work, but it's mostly the lack of obvious color because mm -hmm. I'll subtly warm up or cool down like the, the tones of the black and the white. So there is a very like loose definition of color, but it's more like a temperature mm -hmm. because I just want to give enough. So the natural, like the, the ways that we understand how we like, use color in what we're looking at like something warmer is going to be a more closer something cooler just fades off in the distance so just knowing that baseline it's easy to create this space but yeah, that goes into like creating like the um redundancy of sewing and then slowing mm. down to sew for yeah, those uh, close-up images but for um like in in South Africa traffic traffic light is called a robot like that uh, fluorescent pink or in this one the previous image like that little yellow fluorescent top like part mm. in it yeah and it's just like it's these little ties that it is an objective reference to color it's like these things that are existing and you're drawn to it like like the fly to a light um, <laughs> and this one I'm thinking a little bit about that angler fish and oh. how it's in like the depths of the sea and you could be floating and feeling in front of you and not know what you're feeling and trying to mm. figure out these shapes. And so like this painting like comes up at you. And so it's the same thing with this idea of comfort and touching and the soft pillow nature of these, thi these like shapes. Um, and then, but like how, how is space in this? And then you see the color and like somehow it clicks or somehow it snatches you like there's yeah. this uh, this way I try to use co color subtly in a way that like adds more uh, questions and ambiguity but a comforting mm -hmm. way like in I think it's disassociated broom too I think there's a photo somewhere of it like that glows really subtly pink on the back yes here it is yeah that one like that subtle pink glow mm. is so subtle oh and yeah because there's like a plate back here yeah right? yeah okay mm -hmm. yeah and I just painted that the fluorescent pink knowing mm. that I wanted it to be like because sculpture is like 360 view but this one I wanted to be more playful where it was against a wall or like you couldn't really see back there but you could see the reflection of what could be back there and that whole like trying mm -hmm. to figure it out on your own and using these anchors of color, kind of what I've been using it for more recently. Yeah. Um, I don't want, we're already at 9.30. <laughs> I'm so bad at this. We just like get chatting and then I just don't. <laughs> um, so I, I am gonna move forward, I think, to just, um, let me decide. I think we'll finish with hmm, one last question. I guess I wanted to know, um, I'm trying to decide what would be the best to finish on. So I think we've touched um, basically on a lot of these themes. I, I, well, I wanted to know, I guess, um, with this kind of work, I'm just gonna flip through them while I'm talking and asking. Um, <laughs> with this kind of work that is so um, subjective, the, the source point seems very subjective um, for a lot of your work because it's so based in the body, it's so based in previous experience and memory. Um, is is the work healing for you guys? And is it healing for others? And I'll go to the what I have for the final slide for each of you. I think this might be, yeah. Can, should I stay on this one, um, 
Sarah, for this question? Um, yeah, um, you can certainly do that. Oh, actually, I think I have, yeah, this one. Oh, might be, yeah. <laughs> a different Better. kind of healing <laughs> yeah. for this one. Um, yeah, I do think absolutely. I mean, I am an art therapist, so I'm going to, yeah, I have quite a lot of experience <laughs> with art as a healing modality and, and really like, like the physicality of artwork is literally um, like, exp like expanding your bandwidth. So, mm. so to speak that like you can hold and like take in and channel like more and more a variety of experiences, whether they're physical and sensory experiences, it's like metaphor, holding grief, letting go of grief. Um, mm. So you, you just wind up with like a larger and larger and larger repertoire of like sensory memories that you can connect and synthesize and make into new things. And so you become that like forest floor in the mycelium, like within yourself and all the memories and, and experiences you've shared with others and like witnessed and empathized with because you've always also felt it. And, um, and those, those um, like traumatic and painful experiences become fused with the fruitful experiences. Yes. It can, um, yeah, it can go through a transformation or also be, um, you know, you can, with traumatic memories, you can also think of them as being somewhat like maybe diluted or mm -hmm. melted or like some, some energetic action, like whatever your creative process is, you know, or like they're lullaby or put to sleep or like, you know, and, you know, in the body, that's a very serious thing. Your, your body's like, it is my job to make sure this never happens again, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be like, oh, it's just so easy to brush over. Like your, your body wants to live. And so it's going to yeah. you know, continue to be re reactive and you can't erase it. Um, but there are definitely different ways that you can compose, um, music, color, rhythms, like, um, as many as you can. And it's, it's helpful to, to continue that expansion. Um, in art therapy also, I refer to it a lot as the freedom of responsiveness. Um, mm. and I don't know if, you know, I guess it's up to others, whether I, I do think looking at art is, can also be a healing thing, especially if we remember to like, take it in slowly, um, mm -hmm. and, and give it time to like sink in and be with it and see it from, I think it, especially at different time periods. Um, one of the, one of a, a writer that I've often read a lot because I used to work with children who are visually impaired. And so I actually did a lot of, um, tactile mm -hmm. work, but, um, John Hall, he would talk about, um, he lost his sight later in life. And he talked about like exploring a sculpture by hand and like mm -hmm. being able to come back to the sculpture and touch it and find something new. And also that he could only take it all in it, it, the same amount of time his hand could move over every detail. Oh. And so he said, it's really so different because, you know, when you're sighted, you just look at something and think, oh, I've got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw it in total. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you, you do take it in, in total. And that's one reason why I think a lot of about the density um, of things in my paintings, like the density and openness, but um, yeah. it's something like also to remember, like there are a lot of places to travel and slowing yourself down is a, a way to be changed by an artwork. Yeah, thank you. Um, Kayo, same question. Is it, is the work, this type of um, subjective starting point work healing for you and do you think it's healing for others the work your work yes it definitely uh heal like it's uh healing for me um it's the sort of best uh, way to <laughs> do that i guess um it's very um in my sort of process it's very pretty much uh in a way meditative mm -hmm. so yeah it's 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 great I, I mean you know i recommend it <clears throat> to everyone you know? um and at the same time i i do i do wish that um i can share my sort of process of healing with anybody you know who, mm -hmm. who sees it right they can kind of like visually follow your hand so it's almost like they're participating in the making mm -hmm. of it too mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. If, if, you know, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Sibley, I came back to this wonderful little detail shot because I love the little, um, like the grid is so gently created mm -hmm. and you sense the fluid running over the tiles. So, um, so well, um, but yeah, so same question for you, like, is, is this, work that has this kind of a starting point healing for you? It might not be, you know, you don't have to say yes. You don't have to humor me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I will not say yes. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, well, first of all, like looking at other people's work is extremely healing to me. It's mm. like, honestly looking at other people's artwork any other like music, whatever, but especially visual art is the most healing thing that I can do for myself personally. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I can't like survive without looking at other people's art to be honest. And I feel like objectively, like, yes, my art is healing to me, <clears throat> but I hesitate to say that because when I'm, when I'm making something um, it feels good to experience like um, something that's difficult or a trauma as I'm making it, if it's related mm. to that. Um, but it's not, you know, I'm just re-experiencing it, which is helpful, but doesn't necessarily feel healing in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And then after it's done, um, I don't necessarily feel like it's like healing I feel like it's just kind of, it's holding all that um, and it's it's just kind of existing alongside me, which is really helpful. Um, you know, I it makes it easier for me to deal with like things that are hard for me to deal with because, you know, they're, they're there and they're somewhere else, mm -hmm. but they're still there. I'm not healed from them. Mm -hmm. It hasn't changed anything about them. It's just given them, given them a place and given me space. Yeah. Not to rhyme. <laughs> this is a tangent that I, that I won't go down, but I will stand at the intersection and just mention it. Um, but I was thinking today about like, I don't know, I was sketching, I was um, thinking about maybe a next series. And mm -hmm. I was thinking about like the history of um, like the unmomentous death. And I, was just so curious about it, like, especially coming out of COVID, right? Like how many people experienced the death of a family member that felt unmomentous because they couldn't be in the hospital with them when it happened, right? It just like passed in during the night of COVID, mm -hmm. right? When like so much else was happening and it felt like that moment of that, that person's like, transition a moment of transition of their life the biggest transition was just like was unmomentous is the word that I kept thinking about and there's something about like what you were talking about that reminded me of it which is that like creating a an event out of pain that has to be healed is potentially healing like just making that thing momentous in a way like marking it to say mm -hmm. it happened is potentially um, healing, right? Like that's why we have um, funerals in the case of a death is like to mark it even more. Do we have to mark a death even more? No, like God, no. We, it's like the most evident thing to happen in life is a death, <laughs> but we mark it even more. Um, and like, why? Why? mark something that is like the most evident thing to happen <laughs> in mm -hmm. life because maybe it's fruitful you know mm -hmm. yeah I think um talking about like grief mm -hmm. emotion is like perfect like to explain like what I'm trying to like talk about there it's mm -hmm. saying I'm of the opinion that you never heal from grief you carry mm -hmm. that with you until you die yourself but you learn to live with it is the, hmm. the difference that might not right. be true but that's kind of how I think about it and you can see it in your like you're creating vessels it feels like more than in most cases mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm going to flip backwards because I skipped over. Yeah, Lindsay, same question about healing in your work and out of it. Yeah, I was um, like after think like hearing everyone else's perspective. Um, I don't even know if healing is the right word, but similar to what you just said, it marks it. Mm -hmm. And it's like that happened. And this is your mark of what you are feeling at the time, get it out and put it here. Cause for me, a lot of like, I don't know if it's healing, but a lot of um, my, the meaning I draw from my work comes from the looking after I do it or do start mm. layering it because it's a very, uh, it's like, I'm trying, I'm trying to tap into my subconscious. And when I was younger and was more focused on the figure, it was easier in terms of using this objective reference to mm. talk about my own body and my own self. But now I'm entering into this more negative space, the space we occupy rather than the space within. And then how do we exist in that space? Um, and even if that space is this body and this mind and I'm just floating in and I don't know what the, what the heck's going on. Uh, so I try to put it all out there on this canvas or in the wood, uh, mm -hmm. whatever I'm working on. I try to work on like five different pieces at once. So I'm always moving and like, oh, would never get like my eyes can always have something new to look at. But mm -hmm. it's in that looking that I like can really think about like what I was feeling at the time and able to understand that better. And so I don't know if it's healing, but it's like a process so I can like, yeah, put a pin in this and this happened and this feeling mm -hmm. happened and we're going to put it here. And now I know that that's how I was feeling because I mean, like, like archiving. Yeah, because as humans, we feel so much and it's so hard to like understand like <clears throat> between like some big event of grief and then your daily like stubbing the toe action and then you see something really pretty and like oh wow everything's great and it's like you feel like you're a dog being like a squirrel and it's so much <laughs> yeah. all the time um so I feel like these are like moments where I let myself sit in it mm -hmm. and feel it and give it the honor it deserves Mm -hmm. But I try not to let it hold on because if you hold on to the same grief you felt the first day you felt the grief, like, how are you going to go on? Like, you need to mm -hmm. be able to feel the feelings and uh, honor them and then feel the next feelings the next day, honor those mm -hmm. because the process keeps going. And if you are actually conscious about it, like you can, what, like what Sibley said, like it always, grief is always with you. You never mm -hmm. get completely through it, but you're able to understand it like a little mm -hmm. bit better. Like, like heal, like, it's not like you look at a really crazy scar and you're like, is that healed though? It's not back to normal and it's never going to be back to normal, but it's healed air quotes. Like, okay, well, what if it's just <laughs> like, but what if it's, it's just, like it's surviving, <laughs> like it's, it's still right. here. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that, um, that like constant shift of attention and the overriding mm -hmm. of, of attention is kind of like reminding me of, Ky of Kaya's work where it's like all of these the identifiable layers. layers. Yeah. yeah. And oh. like, but that the top layer always colors what was underneath. So that, or, that yeah. initial fresh feeling whether it's grief or joy or whatever like you're trying to pin it as what it is and leave it identifiable in that fresh moment of it like when it was when that feeling was conceived you want it to remain like portrayed as that so that it's archived as that you know yes and but i also like constantly like over overridden yeah. Yeah, I like I'll add layers and like multiple layers, but I try to um, keep with the initial theme of like the chance and the and uh, like the first initial marks and what right. I was feeling for those and just build those up and try to find form and composition and space within those first marks. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm, I know we're like way over. Um, I'm going to, um, and I'm going to um, stop sharing so that we can come back out. Um, 
And I'm going to allow uh, audience members, if you want to unmute yourself and turn your camera on, um, you can now if you'd like to ask your question yourself. Otherwise, I can still see the chat. Um, well, I don't see any questions. I don't think there are any questions right now in the chat, but um, while we're waiting for any possible questions, I wanna give each of the artists a moment for a plug, um, <laughs> shameless plug time, if you have anything coming up. And I say that um, also at fully acknowledging that like artists are humans and they don't always need to have something coming up. <laughs> <laughs> like you could just be making work and just be in the studio and bless you for that. <laughs> so like if you happen to have anything coming up, otherwise just like where can people find you and keep up with you? Um, I think everybody here is on Instagram and everybody has a website, which is linked through Ice Cream Social site too. So um, yeah, you guys, who's, does anyone have anything? coming up um, I just started the um a virtual residency with the post-human arts network and oh, so cool. there will be um some That's online familiar. um yeah it's posthumanart.com is the uh website and there's a new group of residents in there discussing like post-human transhuman concepts and also there so there's a philosophy side and there's also the artists who are um trying to have some form, build some form <laughs> to the ideas. Um, so something is gonna come from that, but I don't know what yet. Cool. Um, I have uh, like two shows, three shows up currently, like the one with the, you and the one at um, the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm and the one, um, a group show, it's a group show also at the museum, but then a group show at the Parthenon uh, Museum here in Nashville with the gallery that represents me, Red Arrow Gallery, and a bunch of other artists with them, uh, encompassing the eight year anniversary of the gallery oh, cool. being in Nashville. So that's really fun. Um, and yeah, I'm on Instagram, my website. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, Hi, um, thank you, Jen, for that caveat that, you know, you <laughs> don't have, it's okay if you don't have anything, because I very rarely do, um, but I actually do have some things going on. I had to write them down because my memory is shot, but I'm in a group show coming up that's called Among Friends. Um, it opens on May 6th, and it's, I think, going to be open for, um, the majority of that month yeah yeah I don't have the date on me yeah and the proceeds for that go to um New York Artists Equity mm -hmm. so that's cool um and I also have a, a residency coming up um the first week of May called Death Factory it's like a alumni um intermedia um residency essentially um Death so Factory death factory yeah okay. um um so i'll post like you know that like on my instagram when the time comes around on my website but it's um it's essentially like one of my old professors bringing back some people that had taken classes with her um mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's going to be video art that i'm doing which is not what oh. i do normally so that'll be fun <clears throat> i think i found them chat Cool, congrats. Kaya, do you have anything coming up? Uh, I may have one, let's see, I'll just show uh, in May. Uh, the date does not, the date is not, uh, you know, uh, fixed yet. Mm -hmm. I, I have a few more projects going on, but you know, it's not ready to, they're not ready to announce. And I'm just looking forward to, um, you know, have a, you know, good time to, uh, you know, make, a, you know, uh, more paintings. Amen. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, does anyone want to pose a question on video? 
Yeah. Um, you guys can always email us too, and then I can pass your question along. Um, all right. So with that, I think we'll close out. And big, big, ginormous thanks to all of the Ice Cream Social Terrarium artists. I say it every time. It's all held up by you guys. <laughs> you have been such great cheerleaders <laughs> during this first endeavor um, of our space. So thank you so much. Thank you for everyone who came. Um, to watch tonight. This will, just like the others, be recorded and available probably tomorrow end of day via Ice Cream Social site. Um, so this was the last panel discussion. Um, the last event for Terrarium, though, will be in person if you're able to make it. It's a live art performance piece by two other artists who are in the show, Susan Luss and Theo Trotter. So it'll involve a lot of movement um, and transformation of one another's work in the space. Um, so that's really exciting. The show closes May 6th. So if you haven't gotten over here, I don't know what you're waiting for, get over here before it closes. <laughs> um, uh, we are in the process of building out more studios. So this will be the only show that has this much open space and like sprawling work all over the place. Um, so it's something to see before the space changes. So thank you. And we'll close out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Do your taxes. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.